we'll begin our discussion under gases. So gases are unique when you get to compare them to solids and liquids. So how different are the gases when compared to the liquids and the solids? So these are the properties that distinguish gases from the solids and liquids. So the first one is that they expand spontaneously to fill their containers. So this is a very simple property that you can easily try out. So I'm sure you've already experienced it out. So for example, if you've got spray or perfume, just spray that just from the corner of the room. Within seconds, you'll be able to, you know, the smell will be everywhere within the room. So that's a very important property of, of gases. Unlike liquids, if you place them somewhere, solids, if you place them somewhere within a room, they will not be able to fill their containers. And then the second property is uh, they are highly compressible. Okay, so what do we mean when you say highly compressible? So compressibility means that if you have, let's say, this container, and then inside of it you have a gas, so if a gas is ending up to that, and assume this is a lid that you're able to move, to press down. So with, with a gas, you are capable of pressing it down and even moving it somewhere there. So that is compression. So they are highly compressible. Liquids are incompressible. You can't compress a liquid. You can't compress a solid. Okay. So if the entire container is already filled up with, with a liquid, you can't compress it. Okay. That explains why in hydraulics, liquids are used because they are not compressible. But gases are. And then they have extremely low densities. This is very true. That's why gases actually exist in the atmosphere because they are of low densities. Okay, Liquids settle on the ground and then when you look at gases, they are found in the atmosphere due to low densities. Okay. So we have indefinite shape. So in the in other terms, we are saying they've got no shape. There's no specific shape of a gas. Okay. So it follows the container. This is the shape of a container. It can fuel any kind of a container. There's no shape of a gas. And then finally, they are able to diffuse and mix rapidly with other gases in the same container. So we we'll understand more what diffusion means. And of course, how they get to mix rapidly with other gases in the same container. Okay, so that is just a property you need to think of. You need to understand. Each time you mix it with another gas, you expect that it's going to mix up. Okay. So these are the properties of gases that make them unique from the other states of matter. A very common <laughs> used term, pressure. When you pass a pressure, you're giving me pressure. <laughs> okay, so this is in my local language. So, uh, pressure. What is pressure? Pressure is the force acting on an object. So, force. So, it's a force acting or that acts on an object. The unit area. So how much of a force is acting per unit area on an object is what we call pressure. Okay. So in other terms, we are saying force divided by area. How much of a force is experienced on a certain part of an object? That is what we are calling pressure. Okay. So... Of course, we've got different kinds of forces. I believe we know that. There is gravitational force. Okay. That is due to gra gravity. Now, in other terms, if you look at this term force, we get to define it to be... We get to define the force to be a push or a pull. Okay. So now, that push divided by the area where you're applying it, it gives us what we are calling pressure. So now, under the study of gases, 
we are going to have to understand the different units that we get to use for pressure. Remember we've already said pressure is force divided by area. So we are talking about pressure within the context of chemistry. So the units of force, we already know it's newtons. And then the units of, of course of area, we are going to be using meters squared. So what do we expect there to have? So Newton per meter squared is one of the units that we can use for, for pressure. So this is actually equivalent to a Pascal. So a Pascal is Newton per meter squared. Okay. Other units of pressure that are going to be very useful is when you're dealing with uh, atmospheric pressure. It's going to be very useful. So 1 atm is equal to 101325 pascals. This is a very important value that you have to know because in most of the cases we're required to convert from atm to pascals. Of course, I can also add that this is also equal to 760 ta. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce that word, but of course, yeah, you can also know that. So, in case they give you milliliters of mercury, a milliliter of mercury pressure is equal to um, eta. So, this is actually very important. So, the moment you know that one atm is equal to that, then you also know that it's also, you can also change the units and just put milliliter of mercury okay so these are the important units that you have to know so one zero one three two five is something that is very very easy to remember okay and just summarize everything and make sure you got it right uh, so one newton per meter squared is just as good as saying one pascal and then we are saying one atm one atmospheric pressure which is a very common unit is equivalent to try to guess so one zero one three two five pascals okay and then we also say this is also equivalent to 760 ta or milliliter of mercury all right so begin our study on the gas laws it's just a few things that you'd have to know whenever dealing with the gas laws. We know that the most important properties that we're going to be dealing with, uh, I remember them as PVT, pressure, volume, temperature. So not forgetting that we also deal with uh, the number of moles. So from these four properties, this is basically where we get to form all the gas laws that we're going to talk about. So the first one is associated with uh, pressure and volume. The other one is associated with volume and temperature. Okay. And then, of course, as you talk about the Avogadro's law, we get to now look at volume and the number of moles. So, from here, we build everything. So, pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles basically make up all the gas laws. So, how easily can you remember them? So, take the first one to be PV as it is. And then on the other side, second and second of pressure and volume. Okay. And then the other property is VT is going to be division. So we can just say V over temperature, V2, T2. And then, of course, this is Bohr's law. That is... Charles' law. And then, of course, we expect to now meet Avogadro's law, which is less volume and uh, number of moles. So it's volume N1. So this is very easy to remember, right? Very easy to remember. Just know that you have first one as it is, and then the rest will be division. So it will be volume divided by temperature and then again volume divided by number of moles very simple right in that order we're able to remember all the gas laws now we need to understand exactly what they state 
Now, one interesting fact is the first three. First three, if you look at them, if it is not part of the equation, then it should be constant. So understand that as we get to look at the gas laws individually. So starting with Bohr's law. So what exactly does Bohr's law tell us? So if we derive the first equation from our PVT, we've seen that P1 V1 is equal to the second, okay? P2 V2 and the like. So in our terms, we are saying they are equal to a constant. So if you try to d divide both sides by V1, as you try to make one of them to be a subject, you realize that these are inverse reproportion. So from there, we can come up with what the Bohr's law states. So you can either state it as a pressure, you can start with pressure or volume. It's up to you. So I'll start with a volume. So whenever you have a volume of a fixed quantity of a gas or fixed amount of a gas, so you have a fixed amount of a gas or a fixed quantity of a gas. So the volume of a fixed quantity of a gas so now, notice that I said if the two are involved, then the other one should be constant. So we'll say the volume of a gas. In this case, what is not involved is temperature. So we'll say at constant temperature is inverse reproportion. Yes, inverse proportion. That means that as we increase pressure, we expect volume to do what? To reduce. As we reduce our volume, the pressure will increase. Okay, and that is true. So if you've got the same fixed quantity of a gas, put it in a smaller container. Put it in a smaller container, the pressure will go higher. So that is industry proportionality, provided the temperature is kept constant. That's what Bohr's law tells us. And of course, in a case where we've given you the initial pressure and volume, if you've given you either a pressure and then ask you to find the second, you use this property. Okay. That's basically what Bohr's law tells us. And then Charles' law. Going back to our PVT, what does Charles' law tell us? So for Charles' law, it's VT. And I said it's V divided by temperature. So now this is equal to K. Now, if you try to make one the subject, let's say volume, you find that it's now B the higher the temperature, you expect that even the other one also increase. So this is direct proportionality. So what is missing is pressure. So in such a case, we expect pressure to be constant. So the volume of a fixed quantity of a gas at constant pressure is direct proportion to its absolute temperature. That's what Charles Law tells us. So equally, if they ask you to find the missing if I ask you to find the missing uh, temperature or volume, where well, we've given you the initials, yeah, you should be able to do that by using that relationship of uh, the equation. That's what Charles' law is all about. Let's try to talk about the Avogadro's law. So according to Avogadro, he related the volume to the number of moles. Okay? So his argument was based on the idea that, according to him, if you get oxygen and carbon dioxide at the same temperature and pressure, since they are the ones that are missing in this equation, at the same temperature and pressure, at constant temperature and pressure, you get two gases of same volume. According to him, you are supposed to find the same number of moles. That's what he said. So if you've got 24 decimeter cubed, 24 decimeter cubed of two different gases. Okay. So this is at room temperature and pressure. There is one more. So uh, a more of a gas, 24 decimeter cubed, at room temperature and pressure. At STP, is 22.4 decimeter cubed. Okay. Of a single more. That's exactly what we need to understand. Okay. So now, what exactly does Avogadro's law tell us? Looking at the equation that we, we are looking at. So in a case where we get one part of it, V1, N1 is equal to K. And then you try to make the volume the subject. 
you realize that there is direct proportionality in that from what we had said there so assume you increase the size of a container you expect that even the number of what the number of moles will go higher so according to him is the volume of a gas at constant temperature and pressure is direct proportion to the number of moles of a gas so a smaller volume has got fewer number of of moles a bigger one has got more number of moles that's according to Avogadro's law provided the temperature and the pressure are kept constant as you perform your measurements okay so these are the three basic gas laws an ideal gas i remember it was the time i was conducting a class with my students and then they were like uh with this student was like what exactly is an ideal gas like so are you able to give us an example of an ideal gas and i was like wow <laughs> okay so basically when you look at gases gases are complicated they are actually full of billion and a lot of energetic gas molecules that collide and interact in many many ways so it's basically very hard to exactly describe a real gas so people created the concept of an ideal gas just like as as a way of approximating as an a way of approximation that would help us to model and predict the behavior of a real gas so this term ideal gas kind of refers to a hypothetical gas something that is not real okay it's just an hypothesis hypothetical gas which is composed of molecules that follow these rules okay so according to the way i've arranged them an ideal gas when you look at its molecules the molecules have got no volume meaning that the molecules themselves take up no volume and then the second point is its gas molecules have no attraction or repulsion for each other fade they are in constant random and rapid motion so we assume that the, the the molecules of a gas are always moving okay and then we expect that these gas molecules they collide without losing energy okay and then of course they have an average kinetic okay so there is a rate at which they are basically moving okay so these are the few things that you have to note under an ideal gas and of course the last part uh the point which says they should have an average kinetic so should have an average kinetic energy that is of course proportion to their kelvin temperature that is the kinetic energy is direct proportion to the kelvin temperature so these are actually the things that you have to note about an ideal gas let's get to talk about an ideal gas equation so at this point i hope you watched the video on the gas laws bohr's law charles law and avogadro's law so we've already built our laws on the pvt and then end there so i gave you ways and means to easily remember all this so Bohr's law he said just look at pv okay so you're looking at pv is equal to k so if you make one the subject you realize that it goes on the bottom right so you have what do you basically get to have on the bottom so we, pr we prefer making volume the the subject so volume is equal to k over p in such a case and then but this is for Bohr's law and then as you get to proceed and talk about vt which is of course v over t you said everything else is division and then of course we also have v over n for avogadro's so equal to k equal to k so it's just v divided by temperature and then v divided by the number of moles so this is where all the other equations are being built from so you end up having v over 
over t, k over t, sorry, and then you end up on the other side having, sorry, actually when you multiply, the temperature will be on top, right? If you try to make take it the other side, even here you find that the number of moles will be the other side, since it was like on the denominator. Okay, so look at what we have so far. So you have V being inversely proportion to your pressure, and then V is direct proportion to temperature and also the number of moles. So these are a few things that we, we now know. So now when you're going to combine all these, since we know that volume is, is available on, on both ends, so volume is equal to, so on the numerator, there is temperature and number of moles. So I'll say temperature and number of moles. And then on the denominator, that's where we have pressure from the first equation alone. So of course, we're ignoring the K constant there since it's common. Okay. So at the constant K, we can take it into consideration to be the gas constant. Okay, so if you put it as a gas constant, from there we've formed the ideal gas equation. How best, is, how best should we make it look? So if you cross and multiply, you have PV is equal to, and then I like writing as NRT. This is something that is very easy for you to remember. So after crossing and multiplying, so this will multiply with it volume. And then you have NRT. So this is what we call the ideal gas equation. It's a very useful equation. Okay. So ideal gas particles which do not have uh, a volume. And of course are not attracted or repelled by each other as the major properties. We talk, uh, we are talked about in the other video. So, so this equation applies to those, to an ideal gas which follows the the properties of an ideal gas. So, of course, we understand that at standard temperature and pressure, the temperature is zero degrees Celsius. In Kelvin, it's 273. Pressure is 180 M. Okay. Let's now proceed and look at uh, a practice question concerning the ideal gas equation. So, the equation that we've derived is... Uh, PV is equal to NRT. So this is the equation. Okay. So we'd have to be careful each time we're dealing with uh, the gas constant. Okay. The universal gas constant. So preferably we're going to know it as 0 0.08205. Okay. That's our gas constant. Now we'd have to understand again the units that are attached to it. So that is L FTM the Kelvin mole. Okay, so understand that. So this is very useful because each time they ask you to find the volume, you have to understand that to say you get liters. Your pressure should be in LTM and then your your temperature is supposed to be in Kelvin temperature. Okay. So that is very helpful. Now, notice that they want us to find our answer in cubic centimeters. So we, we disregard that first of all and then get to find it in liters and then we get to make a conversion at the end. Okay. So we've been given the number of moles. We've been given the pressure in ATM already. We just have to convert the, the temperature to Kelvin by adding a 273 to the 19. So 273 plus 19 is 292 Kelvins. So we need to find the volume. Everything else is given. Pressure has been given to be 1.9. We substitute. Our volume is what we're trying to find. Equal to the number of moles we've been given to be 2.4 by 10 to the power minus 4 moles. Uh, the gas rate constant has been given to be... Exactly, this is a constant that you need to check when most papers they get to give you and then multiply by the temperature so i'll put the units as well for the constant i just didn't have enough space 
multiply by the temperature in, as 292 Kelvin. Okay, so what we're multiplying, this is per means it's on the bottom, so it's going to cancel with the Kelvin, and then the more cancel with the mos. so remain with LATM. So on the left hand side, we just have 1.9. So we'll perform our calculation first of all on our right, 292 multiplied by 0 0.08205 multiplied by 2.4 by 10 to the power minus 4. Okay, so the answer that I'm getting is 5.75. So we have 1.9 ATM volume is equal to 5.75 by 10 to the power minus 3. The units that are remaining L ATM. So we'd have to divide by the 1.9 ATM remaining on our left hand side. So that we just remain with the volume as be our requirement. So our volume is going to be equal to so divided by 1.9. So let me just do this. So divided by 1.9. I'm getting 3.026 by 10 to the power minus 3 in liters. The LTM would cancel after we divide both sides. So just many liters. Now, um, now we've reached a point where we now understand that a liter, one liter, which is also decimeter cubed, is equal to a thousand. Okay or 10 to the power 3 cubic centimeters. So that implies that for us to move from liters to go to the cubic centimeters, we have to multiply by 10 to the power 3. So therefore our volume is supposed to be multiplied by 1000, which will just be 3.026 in cubic centimeters. So that's the required solution. And just a tip, each time they've given you uh, different values. Look at the least number of significant figures. So the least number of significant figures is we've got two. So our answer can just be 3.0 cubic centimeter. That's that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Dalton's law of partial pressures. Okay. So what exactly is partial pressure? Partial pressure is a pressure exerted by a particular component of a gas mixture. So if you have a mixture of gases, the pressure exerted by a particular component of the gas mixture is what we are defining or calling partial pressure. So when you have got a mixture of gases, there is a certain pressure that is exerted by a particular type of a gas. So that is what we call partial pressure. Now, according to Dalton's law of partial pressures, the total pressure of a mixture of gases equals the sum of the pressures that each would exert if it were present alone. Okay, so this is something that is very simple. It, 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 it actually makes sense in the sense that if you're looking at the a gas, gas mixture, and then you've got type A gas, type B, type C. According to Dalton's law of partial pressures, it tells us to say that the total pressure of this mixture is equal to the summation of the individual partial pressures. Okay? So, partial pressure is basically the pressure that a gas would exert if it were present alone in that container. Okay? It's something that is very simple. So, in form of a formula, we can write it to say total pressure total pressure is equal to the summation of the individual partial pressures of a gas mixture. So this is dependent on the number of gases you have in your mixture. Okay, not restricted. So one other thing that we have to understand is basically how we get to determine the the partial pressure. So we'll consider partial pressure one of this particular gas. 
So every partial pressure can be determined as the more fraction multiplied by the total pressure. So the total pressure is basically the same total pressure. So how is that the partial pressure? So first to understand this formula, what we're trying to say is this small fraction is basically the number of moles of that gas divided by the total number of moles in that mixture multiplied by the total pressure. That's how we get the partial pressure. Okay, so it makes sense as we get to look at a certain example just here. So a cylinder of a compressed gas is labeled with that composition in moles in terms of percentage. So we've got 4.5%, 3%. Of course, the remaining percentage is for nitrogen. So if we get to perform our calculation there, 4.5 plus 3 subtract from 100, we expect to have 92.5%. Okay. So what is our percentage there for nitrogen gas? So the question is asking us to calculate the partial pressure of each gas. So we've already looked at the formula for partial pressure. We've said it is equal to the total pressure. Of course, I can start with a more fraction. So a more fraction of that particular gas multiplied by the total pressure of a gas mixture. That is the formula for the partial pressure. So we need to ask ourselves, ourselves the question to say, okay, looking at the piece of information we've been given, we've been given the number of moles quite all right, we appreciate that. So possibly we're able to determine the more fraction, right? Okay. Now, are we able to determine the total pressure? Are we able to determine the total pressure? That's the question now. So the pressure gauge attached to a cylinder reads, so that is the total pressure. Okay. That is the total pressure. So how basically do we get to under that? So that is going to be straightforward. So considering the first gas. So it's going to be 4.5. Now the total of is 100. Since in this case it's, it is in terms of 100. That's a, that's a good part. So assuming these percentages were not present. For you to get the total number of moles, you'd have to add them. Of course, in this case, it will still give us 100. So that's how you get to find the more fraction. The number of moles of a particular gas divided by the total number of moles. So again, it's the total pressure, which is 46 atm. So 4.5 divided by 100 multiplied by 46. So we have 2.07 atm. Of what? Of H2 that. So of course the same procedure applies to all the other remaining two gases. You can do the same 3 over 100 times 46 atm to get the pressure for carbon dioxide and nitrogen respectively in 2.5 by 100 multiplied by that pressure. So this is exactly how you get to determine the partial pressure. In a case where they give us the partial pressures of each gas and then they ask us to find the pressure of a mixture, you'd have to add them. Okay, so every time we want to understand the relationship that is between partial pressure and vapor pressure, we we'll have to look at the, the concept of Dalton's law of partial pressures. So it also applies to vapor pressure. So exactly looking at what we have in this case, we have hydrogen gas. Okay, so I'll read the question. Hydrogen gas is produced when zinc reacts with sulfuric acid. So I'll write first of all the reaction that we have. We have zinc reacting with sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid is H2SO4. So what are the expected products? We expect to have the salt production. So zinc sulfate plus hydrogen gas. Okay, that's what we need to expect. Uh, okay, so the products, of course, we are told thereafter, if 159 milliliters of hydrogen gas is collected over water, so every correction over water, you have to expect something like this. Okay. So it's like, this is what you have. And then of course, you have water there. So that is correction over water. So you have kind of like a tube that comes like that. And then you find that on top there, you have production of what? Hydrogen gas. Now every correction over water, you expect that 
there should be presence of what of vapor on top as well on top of the water so we've got vapor pressure and hydrogen gas as a mixture okay so just a reminder on the aspect of of Dalton's law of partial pressure the total pressure of a gas mixture is equal to the summation of the partial pressures of the gases in the mixture so pressure one pressure two of course the partial pressures okay depending on how many they are so in this case from our collection that tube we've seen that in addition to hydrogen we also had vapor pressure at present so we are restricted to the pressure of the pressure of the hydrogen gas so say pressure of the gas plus the pressure of vapor okay so this formula is also very useful it comes from the Dalton's law of partial pressures okay <coughs> so understanding the question further we are told we are given the the volume of the hydrogen gas that was collected we are also given the temperature and then we are given the the, the the pressure of the mixture which is the barometric pressure and then we've been asked to determine how many grams of zinc were used up the vapor pressure of water has been given okay so in this case for us to basically get to find the mass of uh, of zinc we know stoichiometry has to apply the information we've been given has been given about the hydrogen gas right okay what information we've been given about the hydrogen gas so we've been given its volume we've been given its to a temperature and then we've also what else have we been given about it i think those are the major things we've been given about it so now looking at this formula uh, in regards to the dalton's law of partial pressure what information do we have so we've been given the total pressure the barometric pressure uh, we've been given the vapor pressure of water and then what is just missing is the pressure of the gas itself so we can use that formula so that we can have the pressure of the hydrogen gas so the total pressure was 738 so first to find the pressure of the gas would have to subtract the pressure of the vapor which is if it goes the other side it would be minus 22.38 and then this is equal to now the pressure of the gas so i've just like uh, perform the calculations direct so 738 minus 22.38 what, what value do you expect to have so i'm getting 715.62 ta okay i don't know if i say we pronounce that word but I'll, that's basically how you get to calculate the, the pressure using the dalton's law of partial pressures so at this point we now have the pressure of uh, of our gas okay that's very important to understand so you know that for us to work with a stoichiometry to get the amount of you know zinc that was uh, available there consumed we have to look at uh, the aspect of the number of moles so the only equation that can help us is the the ideal gas equation where we look at um, pv being equal to nrt okay so looking at the hydrogen gas we've been given its pressure uh the volume has been given and then what else has been given the the temperature has been given so looking at the temperature the temperature is in 24 degrees celsius is in degrees celsius sorry so what determines the, the gas constant we get to use is uh we look at the volume volume and pressure so if you want to use atm and liters the value of r is 0 0.08 to 1 so this applies to atm liters kelvin per mole okay this is very important okay very very important to understand all that okay so if you don't understand you can watch a video i will explain what value of the rate constant you get to apply to depending on the units you have you've been given so you're looking at this value of vara it is a requirement that we need to have our volume in liters and of course uh, a liter is equal to a thousand milliliters of course we know what milli is the same as multiplying by 10 to minus 3 so you can just divide by a thousand to have it in liters so the pressure we have to move from that to to atm 
So we know one ATM is equal to like uh, 750. Yeah, it should be 756. Okay. So we have to perform that conversion from from partial from ATM. So from the tab that we've been given to to ATM since we are using the so basically in this case if we have uh, let me put it this way so 760 sorry so this is our <laughs> so our pressure one atm is equal to 760 at ta so we've got 715 so we'll have to say the conversion factor is one atm is equal to 760 ta so in this case we have 715 Point six two, so cross and multiply. Try to find the missing value there. So seven fifteen point six two uh, divided by seven hundred and sixty. Uh, what value am I getting for eight um, So zero point nine four. So our pressure is zero point nine four. 0 0.9416 ATM. So we have our pressure. So 0 0.9416. Our volume has to be in liters by dividing 159 by lit by 1000. Uh, with 0 0.159. The number of moles we don't know. The R is 0 0.0821. The temperature 24 adds to go to you know to kelvin temperature so 24 plus 273 273 plus 24 297 so all the units are matching up with the, the constant so directly you can just divide both sides by the product pair so in other terms we are just moving all this dividing it to both, both sides Okay, so grab your calculator there. 0.9416 multiplied by 0 0.159 divided by 0 0.0821 divided by 297. So the value of the number of moles I'm getting is, is basically equal to, so number of moles is equal to 6.13. Nine nine times ten to the power negative three moles. That's the value we're getting of of the hydrogen gas. Now, as it stands, if you look at the more ratios going back to isotherm,etry which I believe you've already done. If you haven't, if you've forgotten, try to check it out again. So, hydrogen gas is in the ratio of one to one to zinc. So in that case, what we understand is the number of moles of hydrogen gas that we produce are basically the number of moles equivalent to zinc that was used up. So in that case, we now have, we can just consider this to be the number of moles of zinc. Now, if we check our periodic table, our molar mass of zinc is 65 grams per mole. So if we have the moles in the grams and, and the molar mass, we're able to find the mass. How do we basically get to do that? So we just basically get to multiply the 65 grams per mole multiply by the number of moles, 6.1399 by 10 to the power negative 3 moles. So the moles will cancel out, you remain with the grams. So after multiplying, the answer that I'm getting as the mass, or the grams for our zinc that we have produced is a value of 0 0.399 grams of, of zinc were actually produced in this in this question. So in this question we've basically seen that the Dalton's law of partial pressures apply even to vapor pressure. Okay? We've also seen the use the usefulness of the ideal gas equation when it comes to dating uh, you know stoichiometry to gas pressure. So in this video we'll just go over the manometer and basically get to look at the way it works. So Basically, the main function of a manometer is to determine the difference between the atmospheric pressure 
and the gas pressure okay so this may be in different ways you may have a case where it is down like this it's all one and the same okay so we're just trying to look at the difference between the gas pressure contained in this part against the atmospheric pressure of course this is in a case where it is open just got an open end there that's a good case we're going to discuss in this case okay now what are we trying to say so depending on the mercury that is present here it basically gets to tell us exactly uh, the difference is going to be so let's consider a case where the mercury in the in this manometer is leveled okay on the left and the right side of a tube it's basically same level in such a case we basically get to conclude to say the pressure of a gas the pressure of a gas becomes equal to the pressure uh, by the atmospheric pressure so the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure of of a gas in such a case now we know that atmospheric pressure is 180 m also 760 okay in terms of ta and milliliters um, uh, milliliters of mercury okay now what what happens in a case where let's say the this side on the right hand side it's let's say higher maybe it's somewhere there how how do we get to look at such a case how do we get to explain such a case okay so in such a case since we're trying to say on the left hand side this is the pressure exited by the gas and then on the right hand side is the pressure exited by the atmosphere so since in this case the gas has pushed greater than the atmosphere it tells us to say we expect that the pressure of the gas is higher than what is greater than the pressure of the atmosphere so in such a case it becomes different in that the pressure of the gas is going to be the addition of so we'll look at this now we'll observe this difference so we'll draw a level line and then look at the additional and we'll call that h so the pressure the atmospheric pressure plus the h basically it basically gets to give us the, the pressure of the gas so the pressure of the gas is going to be the atmospheric pressure plus C, the extra height there because in this case the gas is exerting more pressure okay now in the case where it becomes the opposite again where we have on the left hand side it becomes higher okay let me just try to show that now let's say it is higher on the left hand side there that far so that would mean that the pressure of the atmosphere is is actually stronger as compared to the pressure of the gas because it has pushed the the mercury higher to the left so in such a case we expect that the pressure the atmospheric pressure or of course in most of the cases will be determining the gas pressure so the gas pressure is going to be the atmospheric pressure minus what we'll remove now the difference in this case there the height okay so the height is going to be subtracted in this case because the gas was the gas pressure wasn't as strong as compared to the pressure existed by the atmosphere so this is the simple math simple math involved when you look at the the manometer okay the mercury based manometer these are the simple calculations that you'd have to understand okay of course Take note of atmospheric pressure. Try to understand that on the left hand side it is the pressure exerted by the gas. And of course, if a gas has exerted more, it will be higher on the right, and so on and so forth. So that's what we need to understand in the basically under uh, the study of a manometer. Okay. So in the next video, we'll look at this as an example to help us understand exactly how we get to look at questions to do with the manometer. Okay. Alright, so continue. We are now looking at a practice question on the on the mercury manometer and this is a question which is saying the the pressure of a gas is what we need to find and then we've been given the height h so in a case uh, by default if it's not stated whether it's on the atmospheric side or the gas side 
is also considered to be on the atmospheric side. Of course, what we mean by that is <coughs> this is an expected diagram of the manometer. Okay. I don't mind the drawing. Though. Um, so let's consider this to be the levels part. So that I by default, we're going to consider it to be on the right hand side. So what is atmospheric pressure? This is the pressure by the gas contained in the manometer there. And this is atmospheric pressure. Okay. So obviously in a case where we expect the height to be 55 millimeters in this case. And then of course the atmospheric pressure is 7 60. Now this implies that the gas has acted more pressure. It has, it has exerted more pressure on the left hand side. Ends pushing the mercury all the way up there with an extra height. So in determining the pressure of the gas, we expect that it's supposed to be the atmospheric pressure plus the extra height on the right hand side. That's basically what it, what it means when it comes to the mercury manometer. So it's very simple. Okay. The concept of the mercury manometer is very simple. So millimeters of mercury is that's the pressure there. So if the height was stated to be on the left hand side where the gas is or on the gas side on, you'd expect that we're supposed to subtract, okay? Because in that case it would imply that the atmospheric pressure was actually exerting more pressure to the mercury that as compared to the gas. Okay, so that's it for this video. I hope you now understand how you get to determine the the pressure of the gas using the mercury manometer when you're given the height and the atmospheric pressure, which is, of course, known. All right, so in this video, uh, we're going to talk about the kinetic molecular theory, okay? Of course, in relation to gases. And of course, we'll basically get to listen using the kinetic theory, explaining basically the effect of an increase in volume as well as an increase in the temperature using the kinetic molecular theory, okay? So these are some of the few things you have to know about the kinetic molecular theory. I hope you've been exposed to something like the kinetic theory of matter. So there is uh, a theory that tells us to say matter. Of course, we know in each time we're talking about matter, we're talking about solids, liquid, gases. Okay. So matter is made up of tiny particles that kind of thing and then this part goes always like in a constant random motion that's the kinetic theory of matter so it's basically what we're going to talk about and we're just basically going to make it more related to gases and of course more in details okay so the first one is gases consist of large number of molecules that are in constant random motion so this is basically what i was talking about kinetic kinetic theory of matter so this is basically what we are talking about here so first of all there is an aspect of large number of molecules so there are a lot of number of molecules so a gas is going to consist of large number of molecules and these molecules are always in a constant random motion okay so they are continuously moving okay so that's very simple uh, the second point tells us say the combined volume of all the molecules of a gas is negligible relative to the total volume in which the gas is, is contained. So that basically, that idea basically just tries to bring this idea, you know. So if you have that, a container, and then you have a gas in there. What that statement tells us is, even if you get to combine the volume of all the molecules of a gas present in a certain container, Comparing it with a container, it is just too small, very, very small. That's what it means by negligible. It doesn't, so that's why gases actually are very, very, you know, it's very difficult for you to, apart from use the smell and whatnot, it's very difficult for you to, to measure the volume of a gas present. Okay. So the combined volume of all molecules of a gas is negligible relative to the total volume in which the gas is contained, the container that is. And then moving on to the third point, attractive and repulsive forces between molecules are negligible. Okay, 
so this is in relation to the ideal to an ideal gas okay so attractive and repulsive forces between the molecules are negligible so even if there may be attractive forces between the gases uh, the gas molecules or repulsions they are too small okay that's what it means negligible they are very very small that they have got no effect on our calculations number four energy can be transferred between molecules during collisions but the average kinetic energy does not change with time provided the temperature is constant so in short the collisions are perf perfectly elastic so you can understand that if you did momentum okay so where there is no loss of kinetic energy during the collisions it's it's referred to as uh, perfect uh, or it's referred to as elastic collision okay so the gas molecules basically they do collide now their collisions are perfect elastic there is no loss of kinetic energy due to collisions and then finally the last point is also very important as it builds up from the fourth point the average kinetic energy of a molecule is proportional to the absolute temperature at any given temperature the molecules of all gases have got the same kinetic energy okay so this is basically a very important point because it basically if we check point four point four we are told the collisions do not lead to loss of kinetic energy it doesn't affect okay but then we are told from in the next point to say but instead the kinetic energy is proportional to the absolute temperature so that's why it was in brackets put that if the temperature is constant so only temperature has got an effect on the kinetic energy of the molecules of a gas okay that's why at this point you are supposed to define temperature to be the average kinetic energy of the molecules okay so at a given temp at any given temperature the molecules of all gases have got the same average kinetic energy because it is dependent on the temperature okay so this is the kinetic molecular theory that you should know it's very very simple it all builds up from the fact that we have very tiny particles making up a gas and these particles are always in a continuous random motion and then they are so more importantly the first point is very important and then of course the last point is very important and you can also know the the second the third and the fourth but if you know the first one and the last one that is enough to you to make reasoning using the kinetic molecular theory okay but of course you can include the fourth one make sure you also come to the understanding of it okay so now at this point i believe we're now ready to listen using the kinetic molecular theory since we've looked at what it is we are now able to listen basically to explain the effect of an increase in volume of course at constant temperature so of course we understand that whenever we're looking at the a volume and then if you're dealing with constant temperature in that aspect you understand that if you're dealing with pvt you understand that pressure is also involved so we understand that from from Bohr's law we understand the relationship that is there between pressure and volume right this if you make on the subject the formula you understand that these ones these two are actually in this proportion to the other so we expect that we basically expect the result to say if increase the volume we expect that the pressure should do what it should reduce now here want to make that explanation using the the kinetic molecular theory how do we get to that point so what we understand is eh, the temperature in this case is constant okay so we've got nothing to do with the kinetic energy here okay so we can make a statement to say as the volume basically gets to to increase as we are told at constant temperature the kinetic energy of the gas remains constant okay so as the volume basically gets to increase okay at a constant temperature what do we expect the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules will be what will be constant okay that's what i was saying to say kinetic energy will not change since we are given a constant what constant temperature and then as we get to proceed but since we are told the volume is going to increase so volume increasing the volume 
increasing. However, so the volume is going to increase. So we can say, so the gas molecules have to travel forever to hit the other container. So <clears throat> this aspect is, uh, if you've got a smaller volume there, then you get to increase the volume. So you expect that, you know that the particles, according to the kinetic molecular theory, they are always in a constant, continuous land of motion. Okay, they are always moving. So we expect that in a case where the container becomes bigger, they would have to travel a bit further for them to eat the holes of a container. Okay, for them to eat against the holes of a container, they would have to move a bit further. So it's not going to be that regular. Okay, so due to that, we expect that the pressure will ends to what? Reduce. You know, because what we understand is pressure depends on how often the particles, the gas particles or gas molecules are, are actually getting to collide with each other. So in a bigger volume, in a case where you increase the volume, you are basically reducing the, the chances of these molecules getting to eat against themselves. And of course, they have to travel a bit further for them to eat against the cores of a container. So they will not be that regular as compared to a smaller uh, container. So we've just ended up with the same conclusion in a case compared in comparison to Bohr's law, except we're using the the aspect of the collisions between the particles among the particles, and of course in co in comparison to the temperature. Now, in a case where you now deal with uh, an increase in temperature, you understand that whenever the volume is the same, the increase of temperature. An increase in temperature basically gets to lead to to an increase in what? In the pressure. So what basically are we trying to talk about there? So we can make that explanation using the kinetic theory. So if a temperature basically gets to increase at a constant volume, the average kinetic energy of the particles in this case will do what? They will increase. Why is the kinetic energy of the gas molecules going to increase? It's because we're increasing the temperature. And of course, the temperature is what basically changes the kinetic energy of the, the gas molecules. So that's the first point, first statement to make. And then, of course, in the second point, we expect that since the particles are going to gain kinetic energy, we expect more at more collisions. So the first point I was saying to say, there is gain in the kinetic energy of the particles due to an increase in the temperature. So... Now we are saying there will be more collisions with the container holes due to, uh, to, due to the increase in the kinetic energy because the particles will be moving more. So hence the collisions will against the holes of the container. Okay. So due to that effect, we expect that the pressure would have to do what? The pressure would have to increase because the, the particles are moving faster. So we are exerting a higher, a, a, you know, that higher pressure against what? The holes of a container. So that's why we have to expect an increase in pressure. So kinetic molecular theory, in summary, we've seen that most things we're talking about is where we are considering the fact that particles are always continuously moving, and then there are collisions, and then the kinetic energy depends on the temperature. These three points are very important as you look at the kinetic molecular theory of even gases to be more specific. So. I think that's it for this video. I hope you now understand the kinetic molecular theory, the main points, and of course their effect in terms of explaining the effect of changing certain parameters using the kinetic molecular theory. I hope to keep that listening if I ask you to do so. In this video, we'll basically get to look at Graham's law of effusion and a few practice questions. Okay. So before we get to look at the Graham's law of effusion, we have to understand exactly what effusion is. So I want you to understand to say effusion basically is the escaping of molecules of a gas from a container. Okay. So in a better or put in a better way, we can say effusion is basically the escaping of molecules of a gas through a tiny or Okay, so consider a case where you have a gas in such a container. So when you get to make a small, a tiny O, okay, so that process of the gas molecules escaping from 
that container is what we're calling a fusion. So the escaping of gas molecules through a dying ore. Okay, so according to Graham, of course, before even look at Graham's law, of course, the common term that we've heard of is diffusion. So diffusion and diffusion are two different things. So diffusion involves uh, the movement of, you know, a gas molecule from a region of its higher concentration to a region of its lower concentration. Or in other terms, we can say molecules of a gas mixing with another. Okay, that is diffusion. So a very good example is a case where you get to spray perfume on one side of a room. Within a short period of time, you get to smell it in the entire room. That's diffusion. Okay. Now, diffusion is, think of you have a balloon, right? And then you get to, it gets to burst. Or you just get to make a certain small, a tiny or using even a needle. So that process of escaping, the, the, the gas molecules escaping from there is what we are calling a uh, fusion. Okay. So according to Graham, the rate of effusion or diffusion of a gas is in this proportion to the square root of the molar mass of a gas. Okay. So uh, what does that basically mean? So we are saying the rate of diffusion or effusion is in this proportion to the square root. The square root of what? Of the molar mass. Okay. So that implies that if one is increasing, consider the rate of for the let to be R, we're supposed to have a lower mass, a molar mass. So that makes sense at all. It does make sense, of course. So that implies that gases with lower molar masses or with less weight actually get to diffuse or effuse faster in comparison to the heavier ones. Okay, that is a very okay statement. It does make sense, of course. So by formula, gram zero is the rate one compared against the rate two of another gas, okay, is given as, so since we are saying the industry proportion, so for rate two, its molar mass is going to be on top. So let me use just different color there. So we can have white. So molar two, molar one. So that's exactly what we're trying to say there. Okay, so the industry proportion. So this one is matching up with that one. And if you're able to remember this formula, then you're able to remember Graham's law of effusion and diffusion. So this one basically gets to give us the accurate value of effusion and of course approximations or estimations for diffusion. Okay. So look at the practice uh, example, okay, to see basically what we're talking about. Okay, so 8.278 by 10 to the power minus 4 of an identified gaseous substance effuses through a tiny ore in 86.9 seconds under identical conditions. And then we also told 1.740 of another gas argon takes that time to effuse. So we've been given the number of moles, of course, and uh, together with the time. So that will help us to determine the rate of effusion for both gases. Okay. Now the first question says, what is the molar mass of the unidentified substance? What is the molar mass of the unidentified substance? Okay. So if you check a periodic table, uh, approximately the molar mass of argon is 39.99. So we can just say, we we'll take it to be 40 grams per mole for the sake of our calculations here. Okay, so previously we've noted to say that the formula for Graham's law is let 1 over H2 is basically equal to the square root of, so we saw an exchange or a swapping, an industry proportionality. So we expect uh, uh, molar 2 and then molar 1. So we are like, what is on top on the left hand side should be down on the right and a smaller mass should be down. Okay. So we want to find the, the missing molar mass. So preferably we can take the one on top to be unknown. So we'll say let that be X. And then for the known one, we use 40 grams for argon. So we can now find, since we know 40, this is for argon. So we expect that on the left hand side, it's on top. 
the rate one is for argon. So we have got 1.740 and then again it's at 1.3 seconds. So we're able to find the rate of diffusion of fusion that is. So grab the calculator 1.740 by 10 to the minus 4 uh, divided by the type which was at 1.3. So what we have is our rate 1 is basically equivalent to 2.14 times 10 to the power minus 6 moles per, what? per second. That's for rate 1, for argon that is, divided by the second rate, which is of course going to be for the unidentified gaseous substance. So... According to the question, we are told 8.27 8.278 by 10 to minus 4 divided by the time it took, which was at 6.9 seconds. So for that, what we're getting is uh, 9.5259 moles. Uh, of, of, course, of course, we have to multiply by 10 to minus 6. According to the result we have, so also more per second. Okay, equal to, and then on the right hand side we have the unknown molar mass of X, and then divided by the molar mass of argon there. Okay, so that's what we have. So we've used Graham's law to come up with a relationship. So at this point, we can basically simplify our math by performing certain iterations. So we can divide the molar. These are matching up. We can also divide them. So we just end up dividing. And of course, we have got a square root on the right-hand side. So we know that the opposite is a square. So we can square both sides of the equation. So at this point, I'll start with what is in the brackets, 2.14 divided by 9.5259 and then of course we would have to square that okay so on the left hand side the value I'm getting is 0 0.050467932 equal to on the right hand side we just have x over 40 since we have squared the square root had to cancel out just remaining the fraction there so for us to basically get to find the value of x from what we're seeing our math is just telling us to basically just get to multiply cross and multiply that is so our x is basically going to be equal to that 0 0.005 multiplied by 40 and the value i'm getting is 2.0187 Okay, grams per mole. So we've answered the first part of the question. We've we've, we've actually found the the molar mass of an identified substance. Okay, so Graham's law is very simple. Okay, what is the molecular formula of the substance? So we understand that the only gas that can give us that molar mass is hydrogen gas, of course, which exists atomically. Okay, and then under identical conditions, how many moles of ethene would diffuse in that given time? Okay, so C would also require us to apply the, the Graham's law of effusion. Okay, in that, except here we're given the molar mass already. Okay, so we can decide to work with either argon or the recently identified but we'll go for argon okay or we can use the the recently identified gas from our calculations uh, okay so for the sake of our calculations we'll go with uh, argon okay so we know according to Graham's law again i'll write it again rate one over rate two is equal to the square root so we do expect the opposite to appear on the right hand side so molar 2 over molar 1 since they are inversely proportional okay <clears throat> what are we saying we need to determine the the number of moles that would diffuse in that given time okay so basically there's a need for us to determine the rate 
So using the argon, of course. So if we look at argon, we basically get to, to we've seen the number of moles and then we've seen the, the, the time it took. So we can quickly determine its, um, its rate again. So if I divide by the time, which is at 1.3, um, I'm getting a value of uh, 2.140 by 10 to the power minus 6 moles per second. And then we don't know the rate there. Uh, equal to, now the molecular weight there, uh, since we say it's uh, supposed to be the opposite rate, so since on top there we've got the rate of argon, we expect it to be on the bottom since they're in this proportion, the, 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 the molecular weight is in this proportion to, to the rate. So in this case, we've got 40 for our argon. That is grams per mole. And then on top, we have to put the molecular weight of ethene. So we understand that carbon is 12.01. So 12 times 2 plus 4 times 1. So 12 by 2 plus 4. So let me use the actual values. 12.01 multiplied by 2 for the carbon plus 4 multiplied by 1.008 and whatnot. Um, so the value, the approximated value is 28.05. Uh, grams per mole. So in this case, we are what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the value of R. Okay. So what do we basically get to do? So we can determine what is on the right hand side since we're able to do that. So 28.05 divided by 40, and then find the square root of of that division. What I'm getting on the right hand side after dividing and then finding the square root is uh, an estimated value of 0 0.837437. Okay, so if you cross and multiply again, you find that your R is going to be on the on the right hand side, right? It will disappear on the left hand side. So for you to find the value of R, you have to divide by the value 0 0.8 on both ends. So the 2.14, 0 by 10 to the power minus 4, uh, divided by the 0 0.8. Um, in that case, the, the value or the rate of uh, effusion of ethene uh, is approximated to be 2.5554 um, times 10 to the power minus 4 moles per second. That is... Okay, so we've determined the rate of the fusion of ethane by relating it to the argon. Okay. Now, considering that, the question was asking us to determine how many moles we are going to fuse in a given time of 91 seconds. So, uh, the rate is like a speed. So, 2.554 by 10 to the power minus 4 moles per second multiply by 91 um, zero seconds so the seconds would have to now divide and then you end up remaining with just what um, the number of moles so multiply by the 91 seconds for you to get the, the required answer okay so the number of moles that would that with a fuse would be equivalent to 0.0, .0 two, three, two, five moles of ethene. Okay, so that's it for this video. I hope you now understand basically what effusion is and how to approach questions under effusion of gases. So discuss diffusion. What exactly is diffusion? So diffusion is a movement of uh, a substance from the region of its higher concentration to a region of its lower concentration. Okay, so if you get to spray, if you've got a perfume, and then you just spray um, from a certain part of your room, within seconds it will be throughout the entire room. You'll be able to smell it. Okay, that is a very simple example of of diffusion. You can also consider you pressing, um, you know, a tea bag in your tea. 
it's it's not tea without a tea bag. So let's say you, you press your tea bag in uh, in a cup of water. So you'll be able to see even without you steering, you'll be able to see the water changing the color to the dark coming from the tea bag. The flavor is distributed throughout by the process of diffusion. So the particles are moving from the region of where they are of high concentration to a region of where they are of lower concentration. Okay. We can also talk about the movement of dust particles and also smoke. They'll move from where they are of high concentration to, to where they are of lower concentration and spreading, okay, leading to pollution. So these are the common examples that we can talk about in terms of diffusion. So the other thing that I would want you to understand is how you basically get to determine the rate of diffusion. In case they ask you, they give you a scenario and then ask you to determine the rate of diffusion. So we basically get to determine the, the rate of diffusion by looking at the gas particles passing through a certain area. Okay. Divided by the time it basically gets to take for those particles to pass through that area. Okay. So divided by the time it basically gets to to take. So this formula is going to be very useful when it comes to the calculation of diffusion. But all in all, diffusion is is not it's nothing more than what we've actually talked about okay so in terms of gas particles it can be the amount of of gas particles so it may give you it may be volume okay so usually it's going to be volume amount of gas particles passing through an area divided by the, the time it takes okay so that is basically what diffusion is and so how you get to perform the calculation about it Okay, so we'll discuss Liu gases behavior. So we've talked about the fixtures, uh, ideal gas. Okay, so an ideal gas is something that is imaginary. Okay, it helps us to generalize the behavior of gases to perform certain calculations. So which brought birth to the ideal gas equation? PV is equal to nRT, where P is pressure, V is the volume, N is number of moles, R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so I understand that an ideal gas is a gas where we get to consider its molecules. So it has got gas molecules that if so the assumptions are this ideal gas, its molecules have got no volume, there is no attraction or repulsion for each other. They are always in a constant random motion. They collide without losing energy. That is elastic or perfect collisions, which implies there is no loss of kinetic energy. That's about an ideal gas. So with a real gas, how basically do we get to look at a real gas? A real gases basically get to deviate from the behaviors of the fixtures. Ideal gas at low temperatures, and also high pressures. So are these two conditions real gases deviate away from the properties of an ideal gas? Okay. So due to that effect of low temperatures and high pressures on the behavior of real gases, we basically get to have what we call the Van der Waals equation which applies to the real gases. So that equation will be discussed in the next video. Make sure you check it out. From the previous example, uh, from the previous video that is, we've already seen the deviation of a real gas from the behavior of an ideal gas. Okay, so the ideal gas equation which is PV is equal to nRT. We understand that in this case we have pressure, volume, number of moles, gas constant, and the temperature in Kelvin. 
Okay, that is the ideal gas equation. So if we've talked about the deviation of real gases, okay, so then there's need for us to use another equation. That's okay. So that equation is what we're calling the Van der Waals equation, which applies to real gases. Though, as we will see later, it also has, comes with demerits, some disadvantages, why it's preferably you can use the ideal gas equation. Okay. But on the positive side, this Van der Waals equation that we are about to derive basically is applicable. It's able to predict the behavior of gases better than the ideal gas equation. Okay. And it's only it's not only applicable to gases, but for all fluids as well. Okay. So we'll be able to calculate the critical conditions of liquefaction and also derive an expression of principle of corresponding states. Okay, that's a bit advanced for now. Okay, all the same. The equation is very simple. It builds from the very aspect of the ideal gas equation. So we just have to make some alterations to the pressure and the volume. Okay. So the way the equation gets to come out is this way. Pressure as it is, and then volume as it is, equal to nRT. So everything else remains the same. Now there will just be some changes that we're going to make to pressure and also to our volume, okay, due to observing the what basically gets to happen to real gases as they deviate from the ideal gas, okay. So to correct pressure, there is an addition of A and then of course N squared over V squared. And then for V, we subtract N multiplied by what? B. So these are just the, the two things. And this becomes very simple in that for pressure, just think of addition and then think of N squared over V squared and then multiply by A. And then of course for V, you think of N multiplied by B being subtracted from what? The volume. Okay. So we we'll understand later that A and B are actually constants that value for depending on the gases that you're talking about. For example, the value of A of oxygen is basically 1.36. Okay. Now, what are the units for A and B? So for A, the units are L squared dot ATM per mole squared. Okay. And then for B, the units are liters per mole. That is for B. So I believe it's not going to be a struggle with time as you practice a lot of questions. You'll be able to remember this equation, Van der Waals equation. So addition, N squared over V squared, V minus NB. So I think of the ideal gas equation, make some alterations gets to look at the, the A and also the B. We'll now look at the practice problem to help us uh, apply the Van der Waals equation. I don't pronounce this, but I pronounce it as Van der Waals equation. So we're going to estimate the pressure exerted by one more, okay, of chlorine. So the values have been given of A and B respectively. So the equation is as simple as for pressure, we say there's an addition of A, and then, of course, N squared over V, V squared, that is. That is for for pressure. Okay, that's the correction that we're basically making. And then, if you look at V, we're saying there's subtraction of N multiplied by B, which is equal to NRT. So we want to find pressure. So what information do we have? We have A, we have a number of moles, we have got the volume in liters. So we'll basically get to substitute. So we'll say P plus, the value of A is 6.49. The number of moles is a single mole, which is very simple to deal with in terms of calculations. And then our volume, of course, is 22.41 squared. And then we'll put that in brackets. And then we've got our volume 22.41 minus the number of moles N multiplied by our value of B, which is 0 
of course equal to on the right which is nr two so due to my lack of enough space let me first of all simplify this before i get to equate to the other part so i need to multiply one squared divided by 22.41 squared so i'd have to multiply that to by 6.49 So I'm getting pressure plus, so in terms of scientific notation, it would be much easier for me to write. So I'm getting 1.29 times 10 to the power minus 2. And then in the brackets, we have 22.41 minus 0 0.0562. So, which is equal to two point two three five by ten to the power one equal to NRT. So, for NRT, for the number of moles, we've got a one. So, if you're dealing with uh, liters and ATM as for pressure, the gas constant is zero point zero eight two approximation, something like that, and then our temperature should be in kelvin so we've got zero degrees celsius so that is equivalent to 273 kelvins okay so at this point since this is multiplication we are at liberty of dividing both sides by the same value okay so divide both sides by 2.235 by 10 to the power 1 which is just approximately if you multiply by 10, it's just 22.35. So divide both sides. So yeah, it will cancel out. So you have 0 0.082 multiplied by 1 multiplied by 273 divided by that. So from our simplifications, On the left hand side, we are remaining with pressure plus 1.29 times 10 to the power minus 2 being equal to 1.0014 by 10 to the power 0, which is just like the actual value itself. So our pressure is going to be 1.0014. Since we're not taking the power zero, is just the same as one, right? So minus eh, the one point two nine by ten to the power minus two. So minus one point two nine by ten to the power minus two. So the value that I'm now getting is equal to 9.885 by 10 to the power minus 1. Now I'd have to take that in terms of the normal form. So that is just the same as 0 0.989. Okay, so the pressure in this case we're dealing with ATM, right? So put ATM. So that's our pressure using the Van der Waals equation. So to compare to an ideal gases the requirement from the question, we can also try to perform the calculations there. So there'll be no need of us having the value of A and B. Okay. So this is for a real gas. So for an ideal gas, we understand that it's just equal to PV is equal to NRT. So our pressure is what we're trying to find. So if you make it the subject, you just end up dividing the number of moles, which is the one, the constant, the temperature, and then you divide now by what? The volume, 22.41. So 0 0.082 multiplied by 273 divided by 22.41. So the value I'm getting is 0 
9 8 9 8cm so I can take that to be the actual value so that would allow me to also extend this one to to four significant figures it was 8 5 okay so comparing the two what's the difference uh, 0 0.9989 minus 0 0.9885 so which one is higher? So the ideal one is what? Higher by 0 0.0139 ATM. Okay. So this is the way you get to use the, the Van der Waals equation to determine the pressure and also the volume depending on what they want you to do. So the value of A and B will be given in in each case, okay?